What's up guys, I'm Lee Morris with fstoppers.com and as you probably know, we have recently switched from Nikon bodies over to the Panasonic GH5. In front of me here are the lenses that we have decided to buy with our new system. And I started thinking as I was buying these and then when I got them and actually held them in my hand, are we getting ripped off here? Why do these lenses cost so much? Let's first talk about our bread and... That's not even the right lens. They all look the same. All look the same. Yeah, all the lenses do look the same. I'm grabbing the wrong ones all the time. Let's first talk about our bread and butter lens, the 12 to 35 2.8. This is the brand new version by Panasonic, the version two, and this is equivalent to a 24 to 70 millimeter lens. This lens costs a thousand dollars. It certainly isn't built as cheap as some lenses, but it's also not built like a tank either. I don't know that it's made of plastic, but it feels almost like it's made of aluminum or some sort of really light metal. I have to admit that when you actually feel how this thing zooms, it does work very, very nicely. It's smooth. It feels very similar to some of the nicer Sony lenses that I've recently tested out or uh, the Sigma art lenses. So I do appreciate the way that this thing is built in that sense. But when you look at just the size of the lens and you feel how lightweight it is, and then you compare it to the other crop sensor or full frame lenses that we have that are equivalent to this, it's pretty difficult to justify the price. This is the Tamron 2470. We love the sharpness of this lens. We also love the stabilization. It's some of the best VR we've ever seen in a lens. So we actually prefer it to the Nikon version. This thing costs $1,300, and if you just compare the size of these two lenses alone, it feels like this lens should cost like double or triple the price of this little guy over here. But you may be saying, well, Lee, just because it's half the size doesn't mean it should be half the price. But check this out. This is the Tamron 17 to 52.8. This is the equivalent of a 2470, but it's made for crop sensor bodies. We use this on our crop sensor cameras like the D7100 or the brand new Nikon D500. This lens only costs $650 brand new. And believe it or not, we are actually putting this up for sale on eBay and I expect it to sell for right around $200 used. So when you compare this lens at $650 or even $200 if it's used a little bit, compared to a $1,000 lens that's almost half the size, doesn't feel like it's quite as robust as this lens either. Man, it's, it's pretty hard to justify the high price tag on these things. Let's move next to the 70 to 200 equivalent. This is the 35 to 100 2.8. This is the, the newest version as well. And uh, again, when you, when you pick this thing up, if you are accustomed to using a standard 70 to 200 2.8 lens, this thing feels like a toy. Again, I'm not sure that it's made of plastic, but it's certainly not a heavy lens by any means, and it's also not big at all. And let's put it side by side with the Nikon version here. This is the uh, VR2 version, and as you can see, it's kind of hard to compare these two lenses. And you may be saying, well, the price of the Nikon is going to be more than double, and you're correct. The Panasonic version is a thousand bucks. I think this version is around $2,200, somewhere in there. But there are cheaper options for Nikon as well. I also have the Tamron version of the 70 to 200. Keep in mind, this is a full frame lens, so it's going to work on crop sensor or full frame uh, sensor cameras. This lens only costs $1,100. Are you kidding me? I mean, if you, if you compare these two lenses side by side, and you say this lens only cost $100 more than this lens, uh, some, something's not right here. Now the reason why I like the 1235 and the 35100 is because they are constant apertures at f2.8. I do not like having to zoom in and then get a totally different exposure. So it's very strange to me that Panasonic is teaming up with Leica to create all of these new lenses that have a 2.8 to f4 aperture. If they're going to make a variable aperture, it seems like they would make the lenses a little bit bigger and do a 1.8 to a 2.8 aperture uh, lens rather than these 2.8 to f4 lenses. It doesn't seem like a, a professional lens, but they're still charging up to $1,000 for very similar lenses to these with variable apertures. So for that reason, I'm personally not interested at all in those options. All right, I'm going to contradict myself a little bit here. I know I just went on a rant about how I don't like variable apertures, uh, but I did also by the 14 to 140 millimeter lens, and this is a 3.5 to 5.6 aperture lens. And the reason why I got this lens is just because sometimes when you're in the field, 
you just want one lens that can kind of do it all. And if you're not interested in shooting in ultra low light and you don't need that super shallow depth of field, sometimes a lens like this is pretty nice to have in the bag as well. But this lens is so much easier for me to justify because it only costs $550. It's certainly not cheap, but it seems a little bit more reasonable of a price than a thousand dollars for a lens where the build quality really isn't that much better than this. Now let's talk about ultra wide zoom lenses. Panasonic does make a seven to 14 millimeter lens that's around $800. But the problem with that lens is it has an aperture of f4. A lot of times when I'm shooting ultra wide, I might be shooting photos or time lapses of the stars and I want that extra stop of light, at least one extra stop of light. So I decided to buy the Olympus 7 to 14 2.8. And I have to say out of all the lenses that I have for the Panasonic system, this is the most impressive build quality. This thing feels like a tank. It feels like it's made of like solid iron or something. I think I could knock somebody out if I threw this at them. This is the Tamron 15 to 30 millimeter 2.8. Uh, we have been using this lens for a little while now to do star time lapses, and we absolutely love this lens. This lens has vibration compensation. The Olympus version for our little GH5 does not. Take a look at the size difference here of the elements of these guys, and tell me how much you think each of these lenses cost. You might imagine that this little guy would be like, seven, 800 bucks. And then you'd look at this guy and say, okay, maybe that's like a $1,500, $2,000 lens. Not at all. The Olympus cost $1,300 and the Tamron 15 to 30 cost $1,100. This lens is actually $200 cheaper than the Olympus version without vibration compensation. I that's really hard for me to deal with. Now, if you don't have a full frame camera, if you have an APS-C size sensor and you don't need a big guy like this, I would suggest checking out the Tokina 11 to 16 millimeter lens. It's $450 brand new. It also has a 2.8 aperture. And when you compare it to this guy here, why in the world would this cost more than double the price than another lens with the same aperture that's made for a larger sensor? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Now let's talk about putting bigger lenses on the GH5. Here I have the Sigma 18 to 35 1.8. This is a crop sensor lens, and this is one of the most popular lenses to pair with the GH5. What I have on the back here is a Metabone speed booster. And what this does is it takes the larger area of light that would shine on the larger sensor and it packs it down to fit the micro four thirds sensor in the GH5. By doing that, what it allows you to do is have the same shallow depth of field that you would have on the larger sensor, but it also gives you more light. So you can actually get a 1.2 aperture with this lens without doing anything other than adding this adapter. And Sigma has just been killing it with this art series. Even if you're not interested in this one lens, check out some of the others that they have in this series. I, I think this might be one of the most impressive lenses that I've ever felt, period. Even when you compare it to other lenses made by Nikon, Canon, or Sony. And here's the funny part. Even though this is my favorite lens in terms of build quality, it's also one of the most reasonably priced lenses. This thing only cost $800. It's certainly not cheap, but you're getting an 18 to 35 millimeter lens at 1.8. There's really no other option on the market like it. So this is your only choice, but it's also one of the most impressively built lenses I've ever used. Now here's the hard thing to swallow. To get this lens to work on the Panasonic GH5, you're going to have to put the adapter in between the lens and the camera. The speed boosters are not cheap. The Canon version that I have here, which allows it to actually talk to the camera and autofocus correctly, costs $650. And you might be saying, yes, that's expensive, but you only have to buy it once and you can use multiple lenses with just one adapter. And that normally would be true, but now we have five GH5s and I personally don't wanna to have to buy five of these Metabone speed boosters. So the question is, why are these micro four thirds lenses so expensive? And I think it has everything to do with competition. If you take a look at how many different lens options you have when it comes to crop sensor cameras, I don't think prices have ever been cheaper. Tamron is making fantastic lenses. As you've seen, Sigma is making some lenses that may even be better than the ones made by the big boys and their prices are so much lower than they have ever been. If you don't mind getting gear that's a little bit used, you can get stuff for 50% off retail on eBay today. 
The problem with Micro Four Thirds is that it's still a relatively small market. Panasonic kind of has you trapped. If you want the fastest autofocus and you want to have the dual IS that works with the lens and the camera body, you're going to be tempted to pay those high prices for the lenses that actually are made by Panasonic because they do work best with the camera body. But it is really painful to spend those prices when we know how well some of these other lenses have been built and how much cheaper they can actually be. So if you're switching over to the GH5 and you want the top of the line lenses that are gonna work best when it comes to stabilization and autofocus, you're probably gonna be like me and you're gonna be forced to buy these lenses for $1,000 or more at the moment. Hopefully in the next few years when the competition comes in, prices will be lowered as third-party manufacturers make lenses that may even be better than the Panasonic options that we have today. I look forward to those times. Head over to fstoppers.com for daily free content and you can check out our full length ultra professional photography tutorials at fstoppers.com slash store. Hey!